Thank you for joining me today. For the ones who don't know me, hello, I am Ranu. So you are at a stage when you need to extend your house. You have defined your needs and to make it a reality, you need to know the various materials and standards that will work best for you, given your uh, budget and the experience of the tradespeople available to you in the market. I have trained as an architect specializing in residences. Today, I will share my experience with you to make this a reality for you by making you aware of how time and money works in your extension. Your house, I believe, more often than not, your house is the single largest investment of your lifetime. And with these tips, hopefully, you will get the best returns on this investment. If you do not handle extensions regularly, then during this talk, any questions that come up in your mind will not be considered silly. So I would request you to note down any doubts that crop up in your mind and uh, get in touch with me and get those clarified. My contact details will be uh, available to you at the end of this presentation. Now I will share my screen with you where you will see images and photographs and I will uh, talk through those in more detail. So I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Uh, just give me a minute to enable that. So this is the talk for today and uh, why should you control time and money because they are the easiest to spiral out of control and that is the worst nightmare of a homeowner so for a house that you start with which is the left photograph on the screen so that it doesn't stop mid construction as per the middle photograph that you see on screen but reaches the dream home that you set out to make in the right photograph you need to be in control of time and money that is spent on your extension or your remodel. Um, a good starting point for this is to be in control of the design. A design can take many forms which are uh, abstract and visual, which are different for every user, but universally the time and money can be agreed upon. Please note that the percentages I will mention throughout this talk are illustrative and relative. They should not be considered absolute as the specific prices will depend on the scope, size and complexity of your project. Uh, if you get an understanding of what areas to handle in design, then you can plan and iron out problems more easily and well in advance. I will briefly explain what design includes. All of you listening to me can design, but because you are the ones to use the space and no one better than you can dictate the design for your space. But design is a very broad term that includes the various boxed headings that you just saw fly in and bounce on your screen. We shall go through all of these one by one. The first we'll start with the layout. A layout, which is also called the plan of your house, is how you view your house from the top. So uh, after you have removed the ceiling or the roof of your house. So imagine yourself uh, floating like an angel above your house and looking down at it. The purpose of the layout, so you can see an example of the layout on uh, the right hand side of your screen. So if I zoom in here. So the purpose of your layout is to uh, tell you the daily use of your building, guaranteeing comfort and ease, the overall size of your building to make sure it uh, satisfies all your legal obligations. It will tell you the size of the furniture that you will later on buy and fit in the space. And very importantly, it will give you the first indication of money that is needed to build it. It will define your budget. Now, these layouts, they will show the doors, windows, fixed furniture, loose furniture, the way your bathroom is fitted out with the WC and the sink, all your kitchen appliances, the way the cabinet doors open, etc. All critical areas shall be given in this layout. Uh, now, what happens if you start construction? without a layout which is superimposed with your uh, furniture that you would like to use. So a real life example, a dear friend of mine who was not a friend at that time uh, instructed this layout. So I'm going to uh, quickly show you what was and what they did. So what they did was this was their existing house that you see bound by the red lines and they wanted to extend the house. So this was their garden. They wanted to increase uh, uh, the space by adding another living and a big library here. So as it happens, if you don't have these plans in your hand, which are made by a designer or an architect, you stand on the site and you tell the builder that you would like a good connection of the existing room. So from your existing dining, you move out to the new library. From your existing living room, you can walk out to the beautiful garden and look at the views. Similarly, from your dining here, you can walk out 
to the library and then out into the garden. Now, do you see there is an absence of the furniture in all these uh, in, in this layout that you see on screen, and this can give rise to unexpected scenarios after the building is complete. So let's have a look what happened. When you place the furniture, it lands bang in the middle of the space. So like you see, there's a sofa here, which will not let you go into the dining room. There's another two seater here, which will stop your flow to this beautiful, huge library. And that those beautiful double doors opening out into your garden, they are bang in the middle of a grand three seater here. So this can easily be avoided by designing the layout and using the correct furniture. This is the first thing your architect or your de designer is going to make for you to arrive at the best solution for your room. Now, how is money involved here? You would have saved money by not ordering these double doors. You could have just ordered a single door or perhaps fixed glazing. So, and then the space would have also worked more efficiently for you. So if you don't have a designer making this layout for you and showing it to you on paper, then my tips for you would be that you should design the layout after doing the full site analysis with the aim of maximizing the benefits that are already available to you in the natural form or in the built form. You should make a list of what you want from your extension right at the start. And then you should work out what your physical space and your budget is going to allow you to make. The firmer you are in your requirements, Early in the design process, the more control you will have over money and time later. So sit with your family and talk through everyone's expectations and be clear of the outcome that you want. This meeting actually represents your first meeting with your architect or your designer. Remember that to change the location of a door or a window after it has been constructed, it will cost you double the amount than having put it in the correct place at the beginning. Okay. Even then, even if you've decided your layout, what is what works best for you, you should check all possible feasible options. So on the screen, what you see here is um, we prepare a minimum of three options for anyone who comes to us for a design. So all these three options that you see on your screen are for the same family and the same extension that they wanted. So this was our first uh, meeting with them after they told us what are the requirements and uh, the requirements will come on screen uh, in uh, uh, text and you will see a corresponding tick mark on each of these layouts to show you that all the requirements can be incorporated in so many different options. So just to give you an idea of the family, they were a young family. They had two boys between the ages of six and 11 and the boys were very fond of playing video games and making Lego models. So what were their requirements? They wanted a kitchen island and a generous dining table. So you will see the purple ticks as they come across on your screen. They wanted plenty of kitchen storage space. They wanted a home office and a study desk area. They wanted a lounging area where the boys could sit and work on their models and the parents could sit and gaze outside into the beautiful garden. They also wanted a full bathroom and a utility room to uh, keep their washing machine, their dryer and their new boiler. Now, once we presented them with these three options, they didn't have to pick one. It was not an either or situation. They had the choice to pick the elements they liked from one, two, three. So it could, the final result would be a mix and match of what they liked with these. Um, again, my tip for you, if you're not going to hire someone, consult someone, a professional for, the, for these layouts, what you should keep in mind is, uh, please check the extent, the depth, the, the dimension, the width of your extension, what will it will be, because you're legally obliged to do so and get permission from the council. Uh, check the arrangement of your physical furniture with uh, the physical movement between uh, the rooms, the way your doors and windows open so that they don't clash with the sofas or the chairs that you're going to put in. And remember, there is a never a one size that will fit all. So your family is very unique. So um, the layout of your friend's extension might not necessarily suit your living. So what you see on screen are these uh, options and plan. They are further tested in a 3D layout. So what I mean is like this. So here on screen, you see uh, the options for the same extension that I talked about. This is so that you as a homeowner can decide uh, regarding the height of the roof at various places. Uh, the insertion of roof lights or skylights in your extension that you see. So you see, these are the skylights. You should be very careful that you have included them. Because if you miss adding in a roof light in the dark corners, you spend more on electricity bills and you also deprive your family of uh, the natural nourishment to keep your body uh, in good health. 
then you also should make sure of the sizes and the number of doors, the glazing doors, French doors, patio doors that you will require to move out into the garden. So all of them do not have to be openable. You have to take a decision on what area should be openable because it adds to the expense. There are various materials that you can use for your doors like UPVC, steel, a composite. So that's a combination of aluminium and wood. And then there, there are various kinds of types of doors. They could be pivoted, they could be bifold, they could be sliding. So you have a huge choice. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that um, it is easier and perhaps even cheaper to lay grass in your uh, uh, garden. But if you need to sit out like the space here and do a barbecue or just have some firm ground, you need to include paving in it. And that inclusion will have a bearing on your budget as well. So these layout decisions that I've just talked about and that you should make with your designer or on your own with your family, these decisions will uh, create a planning set of drawings. These planning drawings will be approved by your local council so that your extension is legally allowed. Another tip of mine to save your headache is uh, sometimes there is a permitted development route with the council. Uh, and people, uh, and, and then there's a planning permission with the council, which is a little more ambitious in your uh, needs. A lot of people will tell you uh, that your extension is allowed under permitted development, so you do not need any planning permission from the council. As that may be, we do not recommend taking the route of starting construction on site without prior approval from your council. So having a good approved layout is the first milestone to save you time and money. Now I will quickly discuss the ways to get permission from the council. Your extensions have to be allowed by the council and there are two broad ways to achieve this. Uh, the permitted development uh, and the planning permission route. So you can see here, uh, they actually give you, sorry, um, let us go one by one. So you can either go through the permitted development route or you can take the planning permission route, which is when your project is more ambitious. Or if your building is listed or in a conservation zone, then you will have to apply for some extra applications. You can check this information with respect to your property, to your house online. Or if you have a designer or an architect uh, working with you, then he will tell you of this right at the start. If you don't apply for these permissions, then you will fall foul of the law and they have the power to take you to court to remove this illegal building and recover the costs for you. So if you do not have the right permission, then the entire project cost of yours is at risk. So uh, my advice would be to re reduce this risk, get these permissions and safeguard your time and cost. Make it legal from the start. The fee for making and submitting such drawings, which are called the planning drawings to the council, is around 4% of the project cost. So for example, let's talk numbers. In a £100,000 project, you will pay the designer or the architect around £4,000 to facilitate this certification. Uh, another legal aspect affecting your time and money would be the party wall agreement. A party wall is a legal document which sets out the rights of the building owner, that is you, who would like to get an extension done, and the rights of the legal owners of your neighbouring properties. So it depends... Uh, uh, you would have to serve a notice. It could be a very standard notice. And the complexity of the notice literally depends upon the proximity, how close your extension walls are to the boundary walls or the walls of your neighbors and how complex uh, or how straightforward is the foundation of the new structure that you want to build. And the notice period before which you cannot start your work, you have to give a notice to your neighbors. So that notice period will range anywhere between one to two months depending upon the complexity of your project. So this is the time factor that you have to keep in mind. The other is money. How, does, how is your money, your budget affected by it? If your uh, works are not standard and you have to issue a, 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 a complex notice to your neighbours, then a party wall consultant is to come on board and you will have to budget for their fee as well. Uh, do not start your works without giving the correct notice to your neighbours because they will have uh, the right to stop your works by getting a legal injunction or seek other legal redress. Another tip of mine is please get an asbestos survey done if you're not sure if there is any asbestos in your current house because if it is found on your site then it will delay your start of the construction. So again, a time problem, a time issue for you, not a problem really. 
uh, and uh, if it is found on site, they will take certain measures to remove it so that it doesn't harm anyone working on site. Uh, now, we come on to the money part of it. How can you be sure that the money you have agreed to pay for your construction will get you the product that you are expecting? Now, there are three broad ways that I will discuss uh, to monitor this. So, uh, on the left hand side, you see, uh, this is the first method which uh, people usually use. So, here, uh, this is when you go to a builder with a set of planning drawings that we just talked about, when you need to get planning permission uh, from your council. So, hopefully, with this set of drawings, the council says everything you want to do is legal. You take this set of planning drawings to your builder and ask him for uh, a quote. So as you can see, there's a, a very uh, definite pile of money here and a very precise cost for your project, which it leads to. The slightly better way of determining your cost and uh, your time would be to follow the middle route, which is to get a set of building regulation drawings done. And these drawings are made for legal compliance. The architect or your designer will make this set for you to obtain the mandatory certifications. And this further firms up your cost, but it is still, um, there is fluctuation in the range of 25 to 35% from the base cost. Now, the third column that you see here on the right is, uh, in my opinion, the best way to firm up the time and the cost of your project. Because in these drawings, oh, so you see, these are the tender drawings and documents. This is how this, this particular stage is identified. So in this set, you, we, sorry, the professionals will include all things possible that need to go in the structure of your extension and on top of the surfaces and the more clarity you have on the items which are included in your drawings and the documents the surer you will be of the money it will take to build which will lead to minimizing the cost escalations which arise midway when your project is under construction so now let's go through each of these methods to make you aware of the possibilities they present the first method to know your building cost is to use the planning drawing set, the left column that I showed you in my last slide. So what you see on your screen here is an example of a planning drawing which was submitted to the council. And I made this planning drawing for a basement of a house in Holland Park in London. So uh, now this might be the best planning drawing that I have seen, but it is not a drawing to be priced for a quote of the project. When you start a building with a set of planning drawings, the building cost will probably be somewhere around 500,000, 768 pounds. As this type of a drawing that you see on screen is a beautiful drawing, good for planning, but it is not, a, uh, uh, it offers you no clarity of what is going inside your building. And so each and every cost which is quoted for such a drawing will be correct. And the judge of that cost will be your builder whom you have asked for a quote. Because nothing is clear in your paperwork at this point, your cost escalation uh, from the base cost that has been promised to you can range in uh, the region of 50 to 100%. Commonly, I have seen it go up by three times. This is because a planning drawing gives you no idea of the materials used in your extension or the workmanship, the quality of workmanship that you expect from it. So now let's talk in numbers. Um, you have uh, a promised building cost of 100,000 pounds, you might easily end up paying anywhere between 150 to 300,000 pounds by the time your building is complete. To avoid this disappointment, appoint someone to make a set of building regulation drawings for you, which will reduce your cost escalation from 100% to between 25 and 35%. And this set of drawings is usually charged at 5% of your project fee. So again, to simplify in numbers, your project cost is 100,000 uh, pounds. You pay 5,000 pounds to get a building regulation drawing set and reduce the cost escalation from 150,000 pounds to 35,000 pounds. And uh, we see countless cases going wrong or things going wrong due to this ignorance, due to missing out of this step. And now I will give you a real life example of this case. So uh, the son of my solic solicitors, Neil, was referred to me. I didn't know him at that point. He was getting his whole house on the ground floor and the first floor renovated, rebuilt. Now the builder, his Neil's builder, left the site halfway and sued Neil for non-payment of monies. Neil, on the other hand, claimed that he had overpaid the builder and did not receive the mandatory building regulation certificates that he was promised. 
and I was invited to uh, judge if the builder had actually built as per the plans he was given. And what you see on screen is the drawings he was given by Neil to work with. Uh, this is a planning drawing set, which I, I should uh, reiterate that my office has not made this planning drawing set because it is not, uh, it is the way it is. And this planning drawing is not meant for a builder to construct with. It is not for construction purposes. To compare, for me to compare the delivery or for anyone to compare the delivery of, of your structure on ground, how it is built, you need a better detailed set of drawings. And that's the next step of a building regulation drawings. So you see here, you have planning drawings, which are not drawings to build with. They are not good for construction drawings. What does, on the other hand, a building regulation drawing look like? Let's have a look. So what you see on screen is an example of a building regulation drawing set. These drawings confirm the health and safety of your building and also of your finances and of the occupants in the building. They will indicate things like the fire escape strategy, the performance of your wall insulation of your windows is that up to standards which are set by the government and getting a building regulation drawing set for your construction and getting that approval from the building regulations authority is mandatory and you are legally obliged to do so. If you further want to tighten the control on the budget and the timeline, then you ask for something called the tender drawing set and documents. That was the third column we saw in those in that money slide. So how do we reach that? I will just tell you about that in a minute. Before that, let me clarify something which is very commonly misunderstood by uh, most of us. There is a difference between the planning permission from your local council that I was talking about and the building regulations authority. For example, your planning permission is given to you by the local council. Sorry, that's not an example. That is a fact. And uh, your building regulations can be given is given to you by another authority. Now, building regulations. So the uh, image that you see on the left, building regulations, they are concerned about they're not bothered. Actually, if you make an illegal three story extension where legally you are only allowed to make a single story ground floor extension, as long as your building is structurally safe, your electricity and plumbing con uh, connections are done correctly and you have uh, your building is fire safe, the building regulations is happy with the health and safety of your building. For an example, they are looking for how your walls, external walls are going to behave. So in this photograph that you see here, they want to see typically uh, that there, is, there are various kinds of walls, but this wall, there is an, uh, this is the inside of the house. What they are trying to make sure is that the heat you generate inside your house, you don't lose all of that to the outside of your house. So this wall is made with one layer of uh, concrete blocks, one layer of brickwork, and in between those two walls, you stuff in insulation. And then that, that will tell you that your house is going to retain the heat that you generate. Now building control, hence in this case, wants a foot wide wall, one foot wide wall. Planning permission, on the other hand, doesn't care if you make your walls out of cream cheese crackers like here as long as the size of those cream cheese crackers is legal the layout the extent and the depth of your extension the size is fine you can make it with cream cheese crackers you on the other hand need both certifications to stay within the law if you do not have an architect or a designer planning this out for you then make sure that you or your builder comply with these certifications now coming back to the drawing section uh, to bring down the cost escalation from the 35% that we talked about when you're using a building regulation drawing set, you can get this down to between 6 and 10% and also take it down further by the method of value engineering. And how do you do that? You obtain a set of tender drawings and documentations. And let's talk more about that. How do they look? So you can see an example of a tender drawing on screen. Tender drawings will show everything that will be built for you and describe in words the workmanship that is expected from the builder for the price you have agreed to pay him. Now these things, uh, these documents and drawings form the basis of the formal contract between you and your builder. And these detailed drawings that you see on screen are proof of what you're paying the builder for. Uh, what we do professionally is to choose the best builder for your project. We send out this information of all your drawings and documents for a tender bid, as we call it. So this information is sent out to a minimum of, let's say, five builders who will bid on your project, who will tell us exactly how much each item of construction will cost and hence the whole project, how much will it cost. Uh, 
uh, a point to note here is that the cheapest builder often is not the obvious choice. You should do a detailed comparison of the quotes and other criteria to choose the best suited builder for your site. After you get the prices from your builders, you know in reality how much is your build going to cost and this is the time to value engineer your project. So for example, you can omit an item of construction. You wanted three roof lights, but you think two would be enough and if you take off one, you don't put the third one, you will save some money. So you take off that item of construction. Or you could replace a material at this point of time. If you think handmade and caustic tiles are very um, expensive, you could just go with regular hardwood tiles or use a laminate instead. So this is how you lower the cost. So your cost escalation, you do your value engineering, and you do all of this by appointing someone to make a set of tender drawings and documents, which will cost you around 3% of your project cost. So by paying, say, £100,000 project, let's again talk in numbers, a £100,000 project, you pay £3,000 of that cost to an architect or a designer, and you can save up to £25,000 in the building cost. If you are not convinced by this method of making a set of tender drawings and going to a builder to select your ideal builder, then my tips for you would be to select the best builder for your project would be check their past work in person, talk to their customers, their previous clients, ask your builder if they will sign a formal contract with you for the construction phase, check your builder's past three years financial statements to see if they have had a healthy cash flow in their company, confirm that they carry a professional indemnity insurance to cover your project, if you want to further secure the outcome of your project, then you use all the standard information, the drawings and the documents. You use this information and then you sign a contract, physically, a, a physical contract on paper, you and your builder, you sign that contract, which will um, become binding to both the parties, you and your builder, in terms of the money and the time that you guys have agreed. And this brings us to the life phase of your project, which is the construction. There is always a possibility of changes on site during construction. This can be because of uh, unexpected site conditions that become obvious once the demolition has taken place, or you have changed your mind, or there is a gap in supply of the items that you have chosen to install on your uh, structure. These changes will lead to changes in cost and in time and quality. So please judge these changes carefully. Now let's specifically look at time control of your project. You should have a start and an end date for your project. If things do not complete in time, you will pay more in off-site rent, or if you're living on site, a lot more inconvenience. Many people tell me that uh, they are sure that the builder will complete uh, my site as soon as possible because he has to move on to a new site to make more money. Completely agree, but this is true only in part. The builder will bugger off from your site to accommodate his schedule. But whether your site will be complete by then is no surety. You control the completion time through a signed contract between you and the builder. And this contract that you're signing with your builder, it needs to be run on site when your construction is happening. And who runs this contract for you? A contract administrator or your designer or your architect. If you do not want to appoint any of these to run your contract, that my tips for you would be Download a legal contract, they are available online. Get it signed by your builder, sign it yourself. Have a brief discussion before that for all the things that the contract shall contain. To control the completion of a contract, there is a method that we use professionally, which is a penalty fine that your builder has to pay you if he exceeds the time, com the, the completion time. So for every week that he delays the project, he will pay you a sum of money. And but this penalty clause will not apply if the delay is because of your um, actions or it is because uh, of an act of God or something like COVID. So be sure when you have your contract in your hand, you write in the start date, the end date, this penalty fine and other details that are required. And you discuss all of this with your builder and then both of you sign on. Uh, another way to control your time is to ask your builder to give you a construction program, which looks like what you can see on screen. So here, um, you, it shows you the key construction items that you see in this axis, vertical axis, y-axis, and the time frame required for them to complete in your y-axis. Uh, so you will see, uh, sorry, I think I said it the other way around. 
yeah i'm sorry so uh, you will see that there is a time for the start of your uh, item construction item and when will it finish how much time will that take please monitor this on site and discuss the progress in advance to keep your delays at minimum if you are ordering uh, items on your own then please ask your builder the date by which he needs them on site and make sure that you get them delivered in time Another real life example, my friend Rina, who recently got her very beautiful house extended and renovated. She lived in her completed house without a kitchen for a month because she was supposed to order the kitchen floor tile. She did not order order them in time. So even though her builder had a kitchen all ready to install, spick and span, she couldn't they couldn't install it because there was a delay in the kitchen floor tiles coming to site and being installed. and at this point there was a delay in the project absolutely but rena could not penalize her builders because the delay was from her end so please make sure of these small things now let's briefly talk of the contracts that i have been mentioning all this while which will secure your standing and your builder standing uh, there are some contracts available online which will help you to agree on the money and the time frame for your extension There are simple legal contracts from companies like the Reba, RIBA, and uh, JCT. You will have to just go through the information carefully to see the contract that suits your requirements the best. Your architect is going to advise you of this and may help you select the right contract. But if you do not want to appoint an architect, then do this research yourself. Download a contract available online. It is not very expensive. It should cost you less than hundred pounds. Fill this contract. Discuss it with your builder. Get it signed. by your builder after your mutual agreement if you do not want to sign a contract at all then my tips would be decide on the payment schedule right at the beginning you can agree it as a lump sum for the whole construction if your project will last for 45 days or less then you pay the whole uh, amount to your builder at the end of the project or you can pay in stages as each construction item gets completed on site so you pay your contractor after he lays the foundations then once after he build, brings up the walls then once after the windows and the roof goes in and so forth uh you should decide the frequency of your payments in uh, such a case will you pay him every week every fortnightly every couple of weeks or monthly it is important for you to pay your builder on time so that he can maintain a healthy cash flow and the work on your site continues smoothly uh be clear about insurances on your site confirm that the builder has professional indemnity insurance and a contractor's all risk insurance to cover damages to your new extension to his team who that is working on site and to any general public at this point also remember to let your home insurers know that there is a change in status of your house so there your home insurers will insure a part of uh, your existing house and all this should have been done in writing another thing to look out for is uh, a site safety clause which comes under cdm which is construction design and management 2050 uh, under this you your builder and your uh, uh, designer if you have one are all responsible for the safety of the site and the people working on your site so your architect is going to advise you of this if you do not have one then please go online and check this and what responsibilities you and your builder have under this um again more tips on controlling your money through the payments you make so you see these examples on screen where these are different stages i'm trying to show you when you start paying your uh, contractor stage wise so after the foundations after the structures and after he's put the roofs and the roof lights in so you are paying your builder on time so that he has no reason to stop work on site but you also have to make sure that his workmanship is good in a formal contract there's a method to not pay your contractor the full amount due at each stage so traditionally you can keep back 5% of the total payment which is due to your builder and this 5% that you have retained with yourself is literally called the retention money so let's say you are to pay your builder 5000 pounds at this stage he has put in the foundations you owe him 5000 pounds but you will retain 5% of this money and you will only pay him 4750 pounds and uh, at every stage this pattern is going to follow you will keep back 5% of the money that you actually owe him now when do you pay him this 5% of the money that you're withholding this happens at a stage called practical completion practical completion literally means when your site is practically complete 
you can occupy it. It's not fully complete. It is practically complete. It is not dangerous anymore and you can occupy it. And so what does this mean? Let's just quickly uh, talk through this. So what you see on screen are various stages of sites that are practically complete. So they're not spick and span, but you can put your furniture in and your architect or your designer is going to tell you when this stage has been achieved, they will issue a formal certificate to wrap up all the accounts and everything else and to keep everything in order. If you do not have an architect or a designer or an administrator to help you with this, then you will have to judge if the site is practically complete, if it has reached this level. And as a thumb rule, uh, you should be able to leave a seven year old on site to run around without any harm to his life and limbs. So there should be nothing on site which is dangerous anymore. And um, you have at this stage occupied the site and the builders have left the site. Okay. And so what are the other implications of this stage? Let's discuss them briefly. When you occupy a site at this practical completion stage, you should be in possession. You should have all the certificates for your building from the building regulations authority. Now, either your builder is in touch with them or you will be in touch with them or your architect can facilitate this for you. So you should be in possession of all the manuals, the operations and maintenance manuals of whatever has been installed in your building by your builder, the boiler, the underfloor heating system, the openable roof lights, uh, anything that he has installed which needs to function and needs to be maintained. You should have the manuals for that. You should inform your home insurance because now the builder has left site so his insurance is no longer applicable to any part of your house so your home insurance will now cover the new build also your extension your dream home will be completely insured by your home insurance um and remember uh, remember to do this in writing with your broker uh, we also talked about penalizing the builder remember uh, if he delays your construction now after you complete a work, do your practical completion and you are in your house you can no more penalize your builder for any more delays of works that are still remaining to be done and again that five percent of the money pot that you have the five percent retention money that you kept from the builder this is the time at the practical completion when you will give him half of that money so you will release 2.5 percent of the five percent that you had kept so let's say, for example, you were withholding uh, 5,000 pounds due to the builder, you will give him 2,500 pounds out of that. Why are you still keeping the 2,500 pounds with you, even though the builder has completed a lot and left site? Let me tell you that. Uh, you are doing this so that, I think I've jumped the slide, sorry. Yeah, you are doing this because once you occupy the site, there are some problems which will not be instantly uh, apparent to, to you. You will know after a period of three months or six months or 12 months, this period is usually written in your contract and advised by your architect. So once you start living in the house, you will notice some things coming loose or not working properly. And at the end of this period of three months or six months, uh, as per contract, you will invite your builder back on site and you will give him a list of things you would like him to repair. And he will repair those satisfactorily and that is when you will release the sum of 2500 pounds the last bit of money which is due to your contractor will be released by you after he repairs or fixes these uh, problems on your uh, in your house uh, let's imagine that your builder does not come back to site to do this then you have every right to ask a new builder to come on to your house and repair make these repairs on his um, by himself and this is when you use that 2,500 pounds to pay this new builder because your original builder hasn't come to repair these things. And then you no longer owe your original builder anything. Uh, now, sorry, just a second. Sorry. Now, all the methods that I mentioned during this talk, during uh, methods to control your construction stage, to monitor the release of money, to quality check your works, verify the certificates from building regulations, right up to the handover of the house. All of this is taken care of by your architect for a fee of let's say 3% of the project cost. Now you pay that 3%, so you pay 3,000 pounds to save you 10,000 pounds, which could have happened due because of the fluctuation or the changes during the construction of your house. You can, if you do not want to employ anyone to run this contract, you can easily run it yourself. And my tips would be, Please analyze every change that is suggested on site to see its direct or indirect consequences of design. So 
you can see on uh, your screen if something has to be has been promised to you to look like this changes judge the changes so that in the end it does not start to look like this something that was promised to you this is a dormer that we made that uh, you were promised that it would look like this does not end up looking like this once everything is complete so uh, another tip that I wanted to give you is that if you do not have a designer or an architect running your contract on site during construction, please ask your builder for the site notes of the building regulations inspector who visits site at various stages. So an inspector will come to judge how your construction is going along at various stages and he will make some site notes to uh, convince uh, to just note down that everything is going on as per plan or he might suggest changes if he is not satisfied with something ask your builder to give you a copy of these notes uh, now to, just to give you a visual aid recap that you can think about later the top left bars that you see on screen is when you work with no drawings so if this is the base cost a hundred thousand pounds of your build that is predicted it can easily go up two to three times not a very good uh, way to construct anything at all. Then let's go to the next uh, slightly better way. You spend about 4% of your base cost of the building. So the base cost is still 100,000 for your extension and you reduce the escalation. So you see the drop in the bars, you reduce your escalation to 50% uh, uh, of your uh, uh, base cost. And then a better way is to use building regulation drawings where again, you pay three to 4% of the project cost and you bring down. So you see the difference between your predicted or promised building cost and what it might actually take you after completion is between 25 and 35%. We have reduced the risk. Finally, the best way to go about it is to get detailed tender drawings and documents made for your extension so that the promise cost and the cost that you finally pay are very, very close. And you can also value engineer it to make it less if you're not comfortable with the final cost of your building. So uh, this brings us to the end of my talk and it brings you inside your beautifully renovated house. And, uh, and thank you for hanging on uh, with me during this talk. Thank you for your attention and I hope uh, you have the best experience with your construction whenever and whatever you do. Thank you so much.